Have you ever had a character just spiral out of control? Yes. He started off being a pompous, creepy, obese navigator in a skin-tight suit before becoming a child molesting, tripper molesting, time traveling molesting, attempted emperor molesting, face melting, hot, Star Wars, bodied creepazoid. He is the sole reason my first rogue trader game ended in death and disaster thousands of years in the past, falling unprotected into a warp rift. But what a ride. Story time. Okay, I suppose I could. Firstly, the players. Ermintrude. The rogue trader, a bookish girl with no social combat or any skills worth anything other than a wide swath of forbidden lore, which the player assured me was sufficient, causing her to lose control of her own ship, as all other players proved more competent than her at every task she was supposed to perform. The arch militant, a horrific genderless mutant with invisible skin, who constantly wears a full body carapace to hide its shame. Simultaneously, my best and worst player. Best in that she always reads the rules, and I love her for that, but she creates horrifying monstrosities, e.g. a mono truncheon fluffed as having an internal pneumatic hammer was named the Rape Truncheon. The Seneschal, who had little to no established personality except for an obscure addiction. He joined the game late, but was by far the most competent and sane of all of them. The Orc, who was an orc and did orky things. The Navigator, who still haunts my dreams. He was an obese, flexible jointed, warbling monster of a creature and maximised the lidless stare power, death gaze, incredibly fast, which meant he could kill any sentient creature with a glance and drive anyone who survived horribly insane. He himself had around 40 insanity points by the end of the fourth session. He wore Xeno mesh armour read as Gimpsit, and demanded to be carried by a palaquin of supple young boys. Oh god. oh god. Of all of the characters, the Navigator is the sole cause of everything that went wrong in the game. Over the course of five sessions, he managed to almost kill the rogue trader twice, burning off both their ears in the process and killing over 60 innocent bystanders. Molested a score of cabin boys, draped himself over the rogue trader's unconscious and dying form, and mentally scarred an inquisitorial interrogator. And that was before they went back in time. The second time. More? While the navigator had previously done some pretty annoying crap, the story truly begins at the end of the player's first adventure. Racing a competitor to the resting place of an ancient space cruiser full of booty. At the end of the encounter, they had managed to gather the lion's share of the goods, and every one of the PCs was in the infirmary. Deciding that their raider which had the lowest possible necessity levels, did not have sufficient medical treatment for the captain and her council. They decided to gravel back towards Footfall to buy a skilled Medicaid officer and a Batka tank. The navigator went through the warp navigation rights, only just managing to perceive the route he needed to take, having fucked up and gone a different way travelling there. Jumping into the warp, he attempted to view the Astronomican and failed. Laughing at this, and boasting about his progress of piloting, he decided to attempt the trip anyway. Now, the last session had been a killer. Traps all the way through the ship, attacked by heavy bolter equipped servitors, and they had decided to ram another shuttle filled with pernithium with their own. So all their fate points had been expended. Guess what he rolled? The insane navigator, only moderately sure about his warp route back to Fitfall, having never travelled the route properly before, with no maps and no view of the Astronomican, rolled triple digits on a 1d100, and it was at that point that five heads hit the table. It was at this point I decided three things. One, I didn't want to go through a 300 plus day warp trip. Two, I didn't want the game to end there. Three, everything is only going to get worse from this point. The crew's memories receded from their minds, and in an instant, over a year rolled by, Every one of them failed their willpower checks to maintain a sense of time, except the orc, who was found gibbering about twisting formless men, and holes where men should be that aged their prey into dust. The navigator felt that his senses confirmed that he had arrived at his destination, and exited the warp. After the standard few hours of scanning, the hololithic display lit up with a view of a lonely red star, 
orbited by little more than a few clouds of dust, their target system. It was at this point that they started to notice what the master of aesthetics was wringing his servo hands about. There was no Vox traffic. At all. No astropathic messages. No beacon for the warp jump point. Nothing that would indicate the presence of the Imperium of Man. With a stroke of intuition, the captain ordered the master of aetherics to approximate the age of the star and compare it with what was known of the Ferb Dunnus system. It was a very hard test, but they managed to determine that the star was approximately 5,000 years younger than expected. It was at this point that the Argor arrays went crazy, registering another ship exiting the warp nearby. A grand cruiser, majestic in its power and age, burst into reality. Its gold-plated walls and angelic statues, signifying it as an ancient imperial vessel. The rogue trader's ship was suddenly hit by a massive Vox override, and a single message blurted out over every single Vox box on the ship, repeating over and over. By the order of Ordo Coronis, and in the name of the immortal emperor of mankind, Disable your ship's void shields and prepare for boarders. The crew at this point started scanning, and with a fantastic roll, determined that fighting was not possible. The enemy ship had all weapons fully charged. Massive layers of void shields, electron overload cannons, which shut down target components, and lance batteries that could cleave their ship in twain with one barrage. Obeying orders, while stashing the orc in the lowest decks, the captain assembled his crew to meet the Inquisitor and his crew. They were not to be disappointed, and the Grand Cruiser docked with their ship, and the Inquisitor boarded over the umbilical cord. Two men and a horde of black carapace equipped bodyguards crossed over onto their ship. An old man, his face twisted in a permanent snarl, wearing an old black robe with a cane and imposing bolt pistols on his hip, introduced himself as Inquisitor Lord refusing to give his name. His companion was an excitable looking man, a number of years his junior. Wearing a white coat with frizzy white hair, he seemed to be expecting everything through some arcane device, which superficial resembled a magnifying glass. The Inquisitor Lord spoke. You will submit to interrogation. The Navigator at this point spoke, which in hindsight they decided was a bad move. How much fun will it be? He hit the ground flat on his face with a needle in his neck, as the black-suited guards repeated this procedure with the remainder of the crew, awakening in a holding cell. Each of the explorers were interrogated. The arch-militant was subjected to sensory deprivation and solitary confinement. The rogue trader questioned, then left in silence, and the navigator extensively and brutally tortured. On the fifth day of their internment, the rogue trader was contacted in her sleep by a man who claimed to be an inquisitor aboard the ship. He offered her freedom and a return to her time, in exchange for his own freedom aboard their ship. He explained that his master was a hardline Amphilian and would kill everyone on their entire ship before risking a disruption of space-time. Agreeing with his terms, the rogue trader was quickly hustled out of the cell and reunited with the horrific Arch Militant, who was incapable of saying after five days of sensory deprivation and failing five successive toughness checks. The navigator at this point was having the time of his life. The pain was delicious and he was having such fun talking dirty to his interrogator. Oh Jesus. Oh God. He was halfway through the midday exploration of his nervous system when there was a soft explosion and the interrogator's head exploded, splattering him head to foot with blood, a gruff man standing behind him with a bolt pistol, thanking his rescuer for the shower. Ew. He then succeeded on escaping Inquisition level full body bindings with four degrees of success on his escape artist check, causing his rescuer to vomit into a corner at the disturbing feet. Running fast, the players managed to escape the ship with the assistance of newly introduced Inquisitor Emicus. This was then followed by a daring transship shuttle chase before finally the players remembered they had a teleportum and transported themselves aboard their ship before their now ailing shuttle was destroyed by a melted torpedo. Managing to quickly get the drop on the cruiser by using a fate point, the players immediately dived into the closest nearby dust storm, which so thick they could determine the presence of a nearby star. This sounds like a movie I've heard. Is this Star Wars? Is this Empire Strikes Back? 
where they've like went into a dust storm. Yeah. Well, no, it's not Star movie. Wars, but it's. I, I remember watching a movie where they were like trying to get away and they're like, quick, get into your fucking. I don't know. It was like space fucking rocks, and I was like, quick. <laughs> so they were like hiding, and they couldn't see them. I'm not too sure. No, don't keep this in. <laughs> Fuck, it's staying in. Keep going. <laughs> While in the cloud, a crystalline object resembling a squid of crystal and pulsing organic black rubber was attached to their warp drive. Sounds like Dark Crystal, like these the bird boys are gonna oh, fight and yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> what noise do they make? I can't remember now. I don't know. Oh, fuck. <laughs> 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 they were at this point told the basics of what it could do. The device was capable of feeding on the temporal feedback of a person being outside of their own assigned time space to slingshot them back towards their origin time or possibly a short distance away. A trip many times more dangerous than the normal warp trip. Players being players. The captain immediately attempted to test it out to jump forwards a couple of years just to try it out. Despite not being capable of determining if that would have worked Sitting in the library, the captain grasped the navigation sphere, a horrifying sphere of ice-cold crystal within which a strange light danced in seemingly familiar ways, attempting to focus her reasonably strong will. She tried to draw the ship forward in time, failing spectacularly. She was hurtled backwards, hitting a bookshelf and falling unconscious under the torrent of iron-back tomes, leaping forwards with an excitement which caused my heart to sink. The navigator grabbed the sphere in his pudgy, soft fingers and in his warbling voice said a few words which were so totally, unequivocally, disquietingly, unfortunately him. Hello, baby emperor. I'm coming for you. Oh, Jesus. Ah! What have we got ourselves into? This isn't good, Megan. This really isn't good. With that, he rolled his willpower check and I cursed the day I had decided to let him play in the game. The dice read 87. Smiling at my relieved face, he pointed out that he had a fate point remaining and rolled a 1. It took me a few minutes, but I managed to decide what happened. The ship immediately fell into the warp and attempted to fulfil his desire, registering in the protobrain of the time circuits that they did not have enough accumulated energy to force their way through time. It came across a short circuit, a jump point if you will, something that it determined would permit it to make the journey. The navigator was the only player who could view what was external to the ship, as the remainder of the crew was running around screaming as warp energy flowed into the ship as the crew hastened to activate the Geller field. The ship was hurtling through the immaterium, passing through the normal level which most ships travelled through, and plunged into the deep end where the big fish swam. There was a singular object which filled his warped vision, a twisting tower, surrounded by twisting landscape, changing, warping, never staying the same. As they travelled towards it, they came across a number of obstacles. A talking wall demanding a riddle to pass was shattered into pieces as the ship hurtled through it at impossible relativistic speeds. Demons? Demons? Yeah, 40k, it's some like copyright reason. (laughs) <laughs> Can't use demons? <laughs> no, okay. not taking this. <laughs> demons were splattered across the boots of a statue of the Emperor. However, many more entered, and with a resolute crack, the Geller field fractured. Smashing straight through the roof of the Great Tower, the navigator screamed as his vision flickered between his filtered view of reality and the tree warp, overwhelming the filtering power of his navigator's eye. Smashing through level after level, some with the consistency of iron, some with pudding. The navigator looked ahead, and time seemed to freeze. A single man, creature, thing, face, form, body, demon, change, stood in front of him. It was an embodiment of change, and he could not understand or determine what it was. Zeech looked upon him, smiled, and he blacked out. Most of the crew at this point had fallen unconscious, locking themselves in their rooms and overriding the emergency open commands on the doors. The orc, however, had no such luck. Charging through the ship, 
He was having the time of his life, slaughtering mutant crew members until he turned a corner and looked upon the creature floating towards him. The creature was wearing the robes of Astropath. The metal plate which obscured its eyes had spread across its face, twisting with arcane patterns, its mouth twisting into a beak, its hands into claws, its hair into feathers, and its eyes burned with a purple blue fire. I'm telling you, Dark Crystal, I'm telling you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, now you mention it. Zeech does have a little similarities to them birds from Dark Crystal. I'm telling you. Hmm. Smiling, he charged it, his chain axe biting into the creature's face. The unbound demon host smiled and shoved both of its hands into the orc's chest, pulling open its ribcage, and an ethereal outline of a bird-like creature passed between them. He blacked out. No, you fucking die. Yeah, it sounds like you did. The crew awoke later, and the ship was strangely silent. The corridors were covered in blood and limbs, walls twisted with screaming faces, and the ship echoed with whimpering noises, pleading and bite of crackling laughter. Reaching the bridge, the crew discovered that the entire bridge crew had died, many committing suicide and gathering before a small statue of the Emperor on the deck. Opening all Vox systems, the captain managed to determine that approximately 3% of the crew was capable of responding to any form of order. It was at this point that they all noticed changes which had occurred. Firstly, the ship was in low orbit around a blue and green orb, the sun. The planets all looked like those of Sol and Holy Terra. However, this made no sense. Holy Terra had no water, nor clouds, or greenery. And there was no Vox traffic here, nor was the navigator blinded by the Astronomicon. Most of the players had undergone changes too. The captain was scoring some dangerous malignancies, which he hadn't found out about yet. The Sinitial seemed to flicker in and out of vision, accidentally dropping items held firmly in his grasp as they seemed to pass straight through him. The Arch Militant gained some mostly useful benefits, including night vision and an even more horrific appearance. Now we've changed from Black Dark Crystal to fucking Fantastic Four. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> the navigator, however, was still lying in the navigator's chambers as he pushed himself off the ground with his hands as he realised he couldn't feel his legs. Turning around, he looked back in horror as he realised his legs had fused at the waist, becoming a long, slender and disgusting tail of flesh, turning him into a slug-like creature. At his player's discretion, his voice also changed, becoming much lower, warbling and unsettling, almost incomprehensible. He was obscenely fat, his head merged somewhat with his torso. He had bones that were so flexible, it was like they weren't even there, and now he had a fleshy tail. Assembling on the bridge, they noticed that their pet orc still hadn't appeared, until the vox box on the wall alerted them that there was a calling coming from the unidentified location aboard the ship. The orc awoke to a splitting headache, and it was small wonder why. His fingers had hardened into talons, his build had massively bulked up, and from the top of his head grew two forward curved, razor-sharp horns. He noticed that his surroundings were strangely different to what he had last remembered. He didn't remember being in this large room, at the centre of the ship, and he certainly didn't remember the perfectly spherical chunk of the ship which appeared to have simply been sliced out with perfection, almost by human hands. Looking to his left, and with a little help from the captain, read which room he was in. Warp transition core device room. The warp drive was missing. With this shocker came another as two red runes lit up on the bridge. Their orbit around the sphere was decaying and the plasma core was becoming destabilised. With a little math, the Seneschal decided that they didn't have enough men to stabilise the core and had a little over 24 hours before it detonated. However, they did have one option. They could angle the ship to collide slash crash with any section of the planet they desired. After a little conference, they determined that if this was Holy Terror, the best place to land would be wherever they had least chance of fucking with time or somewhere where almost nobody lived, and their ship would not kill an overly large number of people. They decided to crash into the Himalayas. Oh, for fuck's sake. Jesus Christ, that's like the worst fucking place. <laughs> oh, God. If you don't know the significance of the role of the Himalayas play in the 40k lore, 
then look them up. I'll give you a hint about what awaited them. The ship took massive damage in their descent, incapable of angling to decrease friction significantly, and with retro thrusters carving massive gouts out of mountains, the ship collided with a massive smash which rocked them to their bones and forced a couple of players to burn fate to survive. They awakened once again, strapped to tables, with a massive man standing in front of them. He was larger than even the Adeptus Astartes of legend and wore massive armour inscribed with thunderbolts and a helmet that incorporates a visor that looks suspiciously like a pair of sunglasses. Their surroundings were white and sterile. A metal door lay to their right, the only thing in the room other than the mountain of a man, the tables that they were strapped to, and the assorted tools which looked like torture implements. Incapable of convincing the man to talk, the navigator's third eye obscured. They have no choice but to wait. In time, the door opened, and a man enters the room. His hair is long, flowing and black. His clothes are a beatific suit of golden armour, emblazoned with eagles. Then with a voice of thunder, strong, majestic and terrifying, the Emperor spoke. I do not know who you are. Right now, I am far too preoccupied with stopping your vessel's plasma-based drive from detonating and destroying the entire mountain. I will now go to sort out your assassination tool, but when I return, I shall tear your very thoughts asunder to find what I want. You have come here, into my place, my house, my world, and attempted to destroy me and what is mine. If you take any action to escape, I assure you that you shall suffer the most horrific mental torture before I grant you the mercy of death. Leaving the room, he took the Thunder Warrior with him and the explorers started to berate the navigator for his stupidity. At this point, the orc began to shake once again, and his eyes began to smoke and glow red. Suddenly, his head rotated 360 degrees, and his mouth broke out into a smile so large it tore open his cheeks just to get larger. It's now turned into the exorcist. Like, your mother sucks cocks in hell! Yeah, it fucking has. Whistling and laughing, the demon thanked the explorers for their assistance to the great power of Zeech, and for their service they would be granted a view of the consequences of their actions. Levitating the tables, and smashing objects out of his way, the demon stalked down the corridors of the complex, dragging the players on their stretchers behind them. They passed by a number of rooms, filled with all kinds of experiments, dangerous weapons, experimental armour suits, and genetic aberrations. While many Thunder Warriors attempted to halt the demon, it tore them in half. The demon finally broke into the last room, at the most central section of the complex. The room was sterile and much more mundane than the wonders that they had seen before. It contained a number of small sealed containers, somewhat like cribs, hooked up to a number of biological readout displays. Inside each of these containers was a baby, 21 in total. 21? Oh, all right, okay. The demon, with a gesture, spread the cribs out to the side of the room and began to carve a symbol onto the floor. Finishing the arcane sign, which burnt to look at, the demon began to chant. It was at this point that the players realised they were fucked and acted accordingly. They only realise now that they're fucked, okay. The rogue trader detached her cybernetic left arm, wriggling out of the restraints. This arm was described to her as being capable of being detached but was however poor quality, causing the rupturing of a great many veins, bleeding profusely. The captain attempted to fire the inbuilt metal pistol, hitting the demon, who recoiled with a snarl. She then burnt a fate point to avoid death from bleeding out, and attempted to cauterize the wound with the remaining muzzle heat from the melta weapon. Now, she had no Medicaid training or experience with melta weapons. She had set herself on fire, quickly dying of shock. Next, the Seneschal broke loose of his bindings by passing through them and attempted to kill the possessed orc by attempting to destabilise and phase objects before dropping them onto his head. He managed to get a metal pole lodged in the demon's face before it roared in agony and smashed him backwards onto a wall with a spine-shattering force. Using his phasing to pass through, he hurtled downwards towards the core of the planet. Thankfully, his power had limits and with a feeling like a bungee jumping, he was hurtled backwards towards the demon, 
before being promptly impaled on his horns as the demon bent over to sweep blood out of the circle. The demon's horns counting as demon weapons, which could pierce phasing. The other two players at the time, both being horrific mutants, well beyond the Emperor's grace, determined this was a good time to stand back and serve Zeech. As the demon raised his hands, claws, talons, finishing the ritual, a colossal explosion rocked the room and a shockwave knocked the explorers who were still alive off their feet. The Emperor stood where there was once a wall, seething with unrestrained fury. Behind him, a massive white-hot path had been carved through the mountainside. The force of his first blast knocked the demon out of the orc, forcing it to manifest fully in reality. Simultaneously with this, the centre of the sigil on the floor opened as a warp rift, growing at an impressive rate. In a short period of time, the warp portal grew, the containers holding the Primarchs falling in one by one, as the Emperor, still strained by attempting to hold back the plasma drive and the greater demon, tore its very existence into smaller and smaller pieces. One childbearing canister, emblazoned with an inverted omega, took a rather heavy smack into the wall, and the baby within dribbling out of the side of its mouth as it suffered irreparable brain damage. With a short period of time, the entire room had been dropped into the warp, each canister spinning towards a different direction. However, the navigator managed to grab a hold of one, following it on its path. Game over. So that, fat guys, is the story of how my rogue trader grip got sent back in time twice, flipped the bird at the Ordo Cronus, met the Emperor, and were pivotal in the scattering of the Primarchs while managing to give the Astartes spiritual age permanent and irreversible brain damage. Due to their intervention in the final scene, the Primarchs were scattered as how the lore tells it, as opposite to how the greater demon would have desired it if he had to fight them off before the Emperor arrived wanting to send them off to Chaos Worlds.